This is Thursday, May 31st, 2012. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Joe Shanahan. Welcome, Joe. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. May I ask when you were born? August 30th, 1979. And where were you born? In Dover, England. And what did your parents do? My father was a management consultant and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. Mm -hmm. And I understand you came from a pretty large family? Yeah, there are eight kids in my family. Kept my mom pretty busy. Uh-huh. And when did you come to the United States? So we came to the United States about 1985. Mm -hmm. And why'd you come to the U.S.? It was for my father's work. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, immigrants. You are an immigrant. <laughs> and you went uh, and you settled in Newton. Settled in Newton, yeah, greater mm -hmm. Boston area. Mm -hmm. And then uh, went to Beaver Country Day School for high school mm -hmm. and then off to the University of Vermont. Okay. And where do you currently live? Live in Natick. Okay. And your marital status? Married. And how many children? Two children. Oh, good for you. Where and when did you enter the military? Entered the military on May 18th, 2001, uh, mm -hmm. commissioned out of the University of Vermont Army ROTC program. And what was your major at UVM? History and Geography. Okay. Why did you join at the time besides ROTC? Well, ROTC did offer a uh, mm -hmm. scholarship, so I was a three-year scholarship recipient. Um, but I'd already always felt sort of a call for service and would always been drawn to the military. So I, I only applied to colleges that actually had ROTC programs. Mm -hmm. um, and when I started, I really enjoyed it and got the scholarship and that's all she wrote. Okay. How did you uh, feel that call for service? Uh, was your, were either parent in the military, any family member? No, I, it just came from a passion for history and, mm -hmm. and a passion for, um, you know, I was dressed up as the army soldier on Halloween and loved to watch war movies and that kind of a thing. So mm -hmm. boyhood fascination. What were your favorite movies? My favorite movies? Oh, yeah. boy. Uh, well, I love the movie Platoon. That was a good uh -huh. one. And, yeah. um, you know, I think Deer Hunter was another good one. So sort of uh -huh. Vietnam-era movies. Right. Yeah. And uh, fairly realistic. <laughs> yeah, right. And you joined the Army. Yes. And any particular reason why, uh, why you chose the Army? It was a part of the ROTC program? It was part of the ROTC program at UVM, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. And that was, they didn't offer any other branch like the Navy or Marines. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Did family or friends join the service when you did? No, they did not, no. Mm -hmm. Where were you sent for basic training? So actually because I did ROTC, they, they mm -hmm. do an alternative path. Right. And I did advanced camp uh, the summer after my junior year. So that would have been in 2000 mm -hmm. in uh, Washington. So Fort Lewis, Washington. Tell us what that was like. That was, uh, it was interesting. It was one of my first real military experiences. And mm -hmm. um, I had also done airborne school the summer prior. And it was a bit of a wake up call, I think, because mm -hmm. ROTC was, it was more educationally driven. We did do military drills and mm -hmm. exercises on the weekends, but mm -hmm. not as intensive right. or for as long a period of time. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of a wake up call. And you couldn't hit pause or go to commercial. <laughs> or get any sleep. Or <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. No. And did, oh, what did you like or disliked about that? About the training? Yes. Yeah. I really enjoyed the camaraderie. I really mm -hmm. enjoyed the friends that I made. Um, you know, it was, it was a great experience and made friends for life kind of a thing. Um, and I enjoyed feeling proud afterwards at having accomplished it. Mm -hmm. um, Any particular stories come to mind of your uh, Fort Lewis days? I think when I got to take um, a helicopter ride for the first time, mm -hmm. that was a pretty exciting thing. In a Chinook too, which is a fairly large helicopter. It's like a bus with two propellers. Uh huh. And uh, we dropped down in a field and came pouring out the back. And wow. <laughs> it was pretty exciting. Uh, you're just mentioning um, airborne school. And what other kind of advanced training did you receive? Well, once I actually was commissioned as a second lieutenant, I had mm -hmm. to do infantry officer basic course mm -hmm. uh, in Fort Benning, Georgia. And then I did mechanized leaders course as 
because I was going to be an infantry platoon leader for mm -hmm. a mechanized unit. Right. And then I also did mortar leaders course at a later date. Uh -huh. now, of course, during this time, uh, you entered the military May of 2001, and then a few months later, September, September 11th. Yeah. Tell, um, tell us what that was like for you. It was actually, I had, uh, I was fortunate, my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, mm -hmm. was still at University of Vermont for another semester. So I elected to volunteer as a recruiter for UVM, and I stayed on for six months mm -hmm. recruiting on campus uh, new incoming freshmen and sophomores into the program. And so I remember on September 11th, I mm -hmm. was in uniform giving a uh, physical test to a recruit. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, I knew at that moment things had changed. And I, I was a history major, so I'd studied, and I felt as though this was a relatively safe time, to be honest, to be in the military. Mm -hmm. and very quickly that reality sunk in and we actually had to lower the flag to half mast on UVM campus right mm -hmm. after September 11th so I was part of that detail and mm -hmm. it was wake-up time yeah right so when did you uh, finish up this phase of your military career so in November it was six months later mm -hmm. in November I went into uh, Fort Benning Georgia for about six months of training. Mm -hmm. And what happened after that? I was stationed at Fort Stewart, Georgia with the 3rd Infantry Division. So right away I was assigned a platoon as a Bradley platoon leader, which had four Bradley fighting vehicles and about 30 soldiers. Uh, Bradley fighting vehicle, tell us about what that was or is. It's an armored troop carrier, so it has a turret. It kind of looks like a boxy tank with a small turret. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has a 25 millimeter cannon on top, and that's where I sat mm -hmm. in the turret. And then I would put a squad of soldiers in the back, mm -hmm. so six, seven, nine, and the ramp would go down and they would come out. Okay, and how, and how many in the squad? So each, I had four squads mm -hmm. uh, ranging from seven to nine soldiers at any given time, and they would we would stick them in the back of the four Bradleys, mm -hmm. and that's pretty much the way we went about. Okay. So this is around the time that uh, we're planning to hit Iraq, or at least it was the negotiations. Uh, tell us what that time was like. We actually were scheduled to go to Kuwait. Mm -hmm. um, it was a normal intrinsic action rotation uh, that had been ongoing since the end of the first Gulf War. Right. And they did six-month deployments to Kuwait. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my unit was in the rotation, 315 Infantry, 2nd Brigade, 3rd ID. Mm -hmm. And we, my battalion deployed to Kuwait um, in, uh, I want to say it was, it was that spring. So it was a spring rotation. Okay, spring of 2002? 2002. Okay. And Pretty quickly while we were there, things started to change. Mm -hmm. So our six-month training calendar was condensed to three months. So it became a very intensive training schedule. Mm -hmm. Whereas normally you would go in the desert of Kuwait and train for two weeks and then mm -hmm. come back for a week, we stayed out in the desert. Mm -hmm. And we just kept training and training. They deployed the whole brigade and then ultimately the whole division to wow. Kuwait. And that was mm -hmm. a pretty clear indication that mm -hmm. something was going on. Tell us what desert training is like. Especially it's, so far from home. It's, uh, it's amazing. You know, it's, it, it has its romances, you know, mm -hmm. the starry nights and the incredible terrains. And then it has its uh, dangers as well. I remember driving through a, a, a field that had been mined. They'd done uh -huh. some mining in the field. Mm -hmm. And it was marked on a map, but it had expanded because the Kuwaitis had expanded it. Oh so we kind of happened upon it in the middle of the night, and my Bradley went over this bump and right into a huge ditch, and we almost rolled over. And so it was those kinds of things could be, make it pretty interesting. But um, uh -huh. it, was, it was pretty amazing. You know, we spent a lot of sleepless nights out there and major mm -hmm. sort of maneuver exercises with dozens or even hundreds of vehicles uh, doing live fire exercises and things like that. And you were still a second lieutenant at this point? Still a second lieutenant, still a pl platoon leader for First Platoon Alpha Company, 315 mm -hmm. Infantry. Okay, and tell us what happened next. So, well, the whole division deployed, and then pretty soon there was um, multinational forces, so other countries also started deploying soldiers. And uh, we actually had a media unit embedded with us about a week mm -hmm. prior to invading. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we'd been forewarned, and we started to train for what we thought our mission would be. 
And uh, I remember that President Bush gave the 48-hour notice to Saddam Hussein mm -hmm. um, to get all weapons of mass destruction out and allow inspectors in. And I think he had a list of requirements mm -hmm. that everybody knew he wasn't going to meet. While you were still in Kuwait, did you ever interact with the uh, native Kuwaitis? We did on a very limited scale. There were mm -hmm. Bedouins, actually, that mm -hmm. we would see in the desert. Uh, they had camel herds and sheep herds. Um, they would pick up our water bottles if we discarded them, no matter mm -hmm. how little water was in there. And, uh, but I didn't get to go into the city proper. Mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, because we were so remote, they really liked to try and separate us from the population. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were about to hit Iraq. Tell us what happened. So I was one of the first units to cross the border. Um, I'll never forget, it was Objective Anne. It was a little Iraqi outpost right on the border between Kuwait and Iraq. Mm -hmm. It was a sort of a three-tiered border. There was a, a fence, a ditch, and a berm kind mm -hmm. of arrangement. And uh, it was right in the southern part of Iraq, so invading from Kuwait into Iraq. And mm -hmm. It was all desert environment. And they opened with an artillery barrage on the night of March 20th. Uh, 2003. The artillery barrage was followed up shortly by uh, attack aviation, so Apache mm -hmm. aircraft came and strafed our, mm -hmm. uh, the outposts, and then we crossed the border. And it was a surge of adrenaline which I had never experienced in life before. Mm -hmm. I'd heard, heard and read stories about people who had been shot or wounded in combat mm -hmm. and didn't realize it until after their adrenaline died down. I thought, mm -hmm. how is that possible? And I remember thinking in that moment, I think just about anything could happen to me now and I wouldn't feel it because it was just awe-inspiring. Just to clarify, when you were talking about the barrage and the attack, who was doing the initial attack? Our, uh, the U.S. The forces. US. Okay, thank you. Now, Iraq did try and, um, they were under fixed-wing aircraft attack as well, so we, mm -hmm. we bombed Baghdad mm -hmm. as well at that same time period. And they, um, they did launch Scud missiles at us Mm -hmm. And we got the signal to go into MOP4, or we got the mm -hmm. gas, gas, gas signal. Right. I'll never forget my company commander driving and doing this, waving his arms. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were fortunate that uh, Patriot Missile took out the Scud that was about to land right on top of us. Oh, Lordy. So that made for a good start to it. <laughs> okay. Uh, as, as you're in the early stages, do you feel that your training and equipment were adequate? I do, actually. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate that I was active duty and mm -hmm. part of a, a unit that was outfitted with sort of the latest and greatest. I remember we, a month before, during uh, urban training, we were given mm -hmm. shotguns, for example, to blow hinges off doors and mm -hmm. things like that that I think some of the National Guard units didn't have. Uh, but we were well equipped. And we had the mm -hmm. plates in our vests, which mm -hmm. a lot of units didn't have initially, too. Right. And did you uh, feel that your, the leadership was uh, adequate? I, I was fortunate to have some excellent leadership, yes. Mm -hmm. We were under Colonel Perkins at the time as a brigade commander, mm -hmm. uh, General Webb as a division commander. Okay. General Webster, sorry. General Webster, okay. Okay, what happened next? Well, we invaded and so began a, uh, a two-week sort of blitz up to Baghdad. Mm -hmm. um, we started going so quickly through the desert that the wheeled vehicles couldn't keep up with us. Uh, and we started going across, basically cutting the corner, going mm -hmm. across rough terrain in the desert. So we separated uh, our brigade into a wheeled convoy and a mm -hmm. tracked convoy. And the tanks and the Bradleys and the 88 Wreckers and these tracked vehicles sort of tore across the desert and outran our supply lines. Mm -hmm. So things like we had to go down to a bottle of water and one meal a day because we just had limited supplies with us. Uh -huh. And we were trying to push as far as we could, as fast as we could. Mm -hmm. When you're saying that, uh, what was your average coverage? I wouldn't even pretend to know. Uh -huh. I know that in just a matter of days, we got from the southernmost point of Iraq to, mm -hmm. it, it must have been you know, less than 50 miles south of Baghdad. Um, I think it was out Nazaria was pretty mm -hmm. much where we got held up and a sandstorm hit us, and it was that sort of biblical orange sandstorm mm -hmm. that was on the news, and everything just came to a screeching halt. Okay, and how long did the sandstorm last? Sa I want to say the sandstorm lasted, you know, memory and I'm sure opinions vary, but I think it was mm -hmm. three or four days. 
And what, just, did you, what did you do during that time? We basically got in our vehicles and sat in mi misery. Um, I couldn't see 100 feet and you know things and people and vehicles. I think this was the time actually Jessica Lynch and that whole convoy uh -huh. got lost. Right. Because you couldn't, you couldn't see where you were going. Mm -hmm. You didn't know what you were doing. So we, it wasn't literally safe to move anywhere with any vehicles. Mm -hmm. And then vehicles also started having a lot of maintenance problems uh -huh. because of the sand that was blowing into them. So we, we stopped where we were at and our vehicles were spaced sort of closely together in the desert and I sat in a turret mm -hmm. and tried to, tried to rest it out. Wait it out, huh? Wait it out, yeah. Okay, so the sandstorm finally alleviates. In the meantime, uh, were you getting regular reports or at least getting letters from home or something like that? At this point, no. I, the first letters and packages I received weren't mm -hmm. until three or four months, basically until after George, President Bush got on the carrier and said we had won that, the conflict, um, mm -hmm. you know, the major combat operations were over. So uh -huh. during this p phase, we were, we were getting reports, but it was sort of scattered information. Um, you know, it was, it was fairly disjointed at that point at a platoon level. Mm -hmm. um, I would get reports from my company who would in turn get it from the battalion. Mm -hmm. And it was a bit of the telephone game. By the time it got to us, I think there were some inaccuracies in there and mm -hmm. we weren't entirely certain. Okay. All right, so the sandstorm finally abates. Tell us what happened next. Well, we started moving further north and we mm -hmm. started to get from desert into farmland. Mm -hmm. So I remember going and seeing for the first time green, which green grass, green fields, the first time I had seen this in, since I had showed up in Kuwait. Mm -hmm. and just sort of being shocked into staring at the landscape mm -hmm. because I was so overcome with just how green it looked. Right. And uh, at that point, we actually came into our first contact. Mm -hmm. um, the unit in front of us, 164 Armor, uh, was actually ambushed on a road. And so what we did is ducks in a row, we all got on these hardball roads that now formed. It wasn't desert anymore. Mm -hmm. And we basically followed a highway, started head towards Baghdad. And uh, the battalion in front of us was ambushed, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we came up to assist them um, that night. Did you see casualties? That was the first time I started to see casualties. So mm -hmm. um, we actually moved during night and didn't actually get there until the following morning. And at that point, the battle was pretty much over with. 164 Armor mm -hmm. had pushed forward. 315 Infantry came in just to clean up. Um, I did shoot my first vehicle at that point with a Bradley. There was mm -hmm. a technical vehicle, a truck that started driving towards us. And um, my Bradley had gotten out in front of my company because mm -hmm. um, they had just got stuck in some farmland and some deep mm -hmm. mud. And I came over a road and um, I saw the, the crew of the vehicle jump out when they saw me and we engaged the truck. Mm -hmm. And at that point I started to look around and notice that there were a lot of dead Iraqis actually around the road around me. What were you feeling at that point? It was fairly surreal. Um, you know, some of the crew got out, took pictures, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. took a look at it, but uh, it was pretty, it was pretty gory. I mean, they mm -hmm. were, they were in pieces. They were, oh my. they were everywhere, so. Okay. So you're still heading north to, uh, to Baghdad. Tell us what happened next. So we, we stopped just south of Baghdad on Highway 8. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had another contact with some RPG teams. And I remember at that point seeing a more concentrated urban population and a, and a less friendly population. Whereas before it had been more for farmers that had sort mm -hmm. of hidden their families when we came by. And mm -hmm. now it was people standing out in the open and sort of putting their thumb across their throat as they looked at us and pointed at us, saying, mm -hmm. sending us a pretty clear message. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we did have some contact, like I said, with some dismounted soldiers and RPG teams uh, dressed in civilian clothes, uh -huh. and we staged for the assault on Baghdad. Okay. Well, what does RPG stand for? It's Rocket Propelled Grenade. Oh, okay. So it's, the, um, it's very common now, like an AK-47 mm -hmm. assault rifle, and it's, they hold it on their shoulder and they basically shoot a grenade out of a, mm -hmm. a shoulder-mounted sort of launcher. Mm -hmm. And they're fortunately somewhat inaccurate and unreliable, <laughs> at least the ones that were being used in Iraq. Right. So it was hit or miss. 
Okay, so you're on the outskirts of Baghdad and some of the local populace don't seem to like you. Tell us what happened next. So we had a sister battalion on April 5th, 2003, uh, 164 Armor again, did a, um, they called it a thunder run, but they drove through Baghdad. Uh, we had captured, American forces had captured Bayat, which is Baghdad International Airport. Mm -hmm. And we were south of the city, and Baghdad Airport is to the west. Mm -hmm. And there's a highway that connects, goes right through the city, uh -huh. connects to the airport. So the, um, the commander made the decision to send the convoy, the brigade commander, through the city to the airport just to see how they mm -hmm. would do, just to see what kind of defenses Baghdad had. All the conventional thought at this point was, this is going to be a one to two month siege mm -hmm. of the city. And they, they made it. They lost, I think, two tanks and uh, I think two soldiers perhaps. Mm -hmm. But they made it to the airport, uh, sort of bloodied and beaten, but having survived, and they thought we could do this. So on April 7th, 2003, the entire brigade, uh, including my battalion, 315 Infantry, went into Baghdad mm -hmm. to take the city. And um, my objective was Objective Mo. It was called Spaghetti Junction. But it was uh, right in the heart of the city, a huge intersection like the intersection of two major highways in, in the states, like 128. Or, mm -hmm. And um, it was about eight or 10 lanes across, and we came into this intersection with overpasses and underpasses, and we tried to capture and hold this very confusing, mm -hmm. um, multi-leveled, sort of 360-degree intersection. And mm -hmm. we ended up having about a 10, 10 to 12-hour battle on our hands to try and hold this intersection. Um, a lot of Saddam Fedayeen, um, Iraqi Republican Guard, and uh, locals with their weapons started to try and get us out of there. And what were they using? It was a combination of things. Um, they had anti-aircraft guns used mm -hmm. in direct fire mode, so they would, as opposed to pointing them at the sky, they would point them down the street. Right. Um, RPGs and AK-47s, mm -hmm. uh, mortars, they had some mortar teams. Uh -huh. And um, you know we were in contact for all day. I mean, this was at first thing in the morning at like 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. and up until the evening we were fighting. And what did your unit counter with? We had we were um, had a platoon of tanks, so we had mm -hmm. four tanks, and we had I think 10 Bradley fighting vehicles, and some of the headquarters elements had different vehicles. Mm -hmm. And uh, so with those 15 to 20 vehicles, we secured the intersection. Um, and it was, I sent my dismounts out of the Bradleys and they took buildings that mm -hmm. surrounded the intersection to try and get, uh, a, you know, a good perspective. So it was, um, you know, basically the 25 millimeter cannons, the 120 millimeter tank rounds. Uh -huh. We even used tow missiles, which are these missiles on a Bradley, typically used to shoot a tank, but we were shooting cars with them. Right. So. Any, uh, casualties on your end? We had two soldiers killed mm -hmm. um, and about quite a few wounded in the battalion. Mm -hmm. uh, the soldiers were killed resupplying, resupplying our intersection because mm -hmm. uh, we'd run out of most of our ammunition and all, about all of our fuel. Mm -hmm. So they're desperately trying to resupply us and they were ambushed en route. And were these people on your, under your direct command? No, they were not. They were under the battalion, uh, mm -hmm. not under my command. So, Did you know them? I did know them. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the mortar platoon, platoon sergeant, Sergeant mm -hmm. Marshall, and um, Sergeant Stever. And mm -hmm. they were both killed by RPGs, actually. Oh. Yeah. So did you um, maintain a hold on that, this intersection? We did. Um, the con All of a sudden, it seemed to really just die down. Mm -hmm. And that night, there was very little activity. Um, some resupplied, you know, some enemy came in buses in the mm -hmm. middle of the night. But, um, you know, that's the strange thing about urban combat. It's very hard to distinguish what's mm -hmm. what. Um, but the next morning, there was uh, one or two shots at us, a mm -hmm. couple RPGs, but it wasn't anything like it was the day before. Uh, and then it was pretty much over. We had also, at the same time, my brigade had taken the whole green zone, the whole mm -hmm. palace compounds. And uh, at that point, I think they knew it was up. Okay. 
So what happened next? We stayed, uh, we stayed on that intersection for, I want to say, two or three weeks. I ended up doing, um, it's amazing how quickly, I guess you could say, the fabric of society sort of falls apart. Mm -hmm. uh, looting started, pillaging. Um, there was no governance, no control of the Iraqi population. We were very ill-prepared to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And we basically secured some strategic locations for the Iraqis. Uh, so I secured a hospital, literally to make sure it wasn't sort of overrun or fell apart. Or, and I did that for a period of probably two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. And it was just down the street from that intersection that we secured. Um, and it was, you know, it was pretty interesting times. Mm -hmm. What did it feel like to be on such high alert for weeks at a time? It was, you know, we started to start a rotation. So we secured mm -hmm. part of the green zone as a sort of a home base. Mm -hmm. And we had this string of houses that we occupied with a gated compound. Mm -hmm. And we would do, uh, you know, like a two or three day rotation. So we would be on the hospital for two or three days with mm -hmm. half the platoon mm -hmm. and then bring half the platoon back to rest. So. For the first time, I got to do things like shower for the first time in three weeks and, and uh, <laughs> eat warmer meals, not uh -huh. exactly the best. But um, we started eating the local food, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, does, it's not good for your um, digestive tract once you're, if you're not used to it. Um, but uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was a very taxing time period. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we all lost weight and mm -hmm. were pretty stressed and on edge for a long period of time. Do you, um, looking back on that period, do you sometimes uh, feel anything like post-traumatic stress disorder? I was ultimately treated for PTSD at the VA, mm -hmm. so um, I did have to redeploy. I mean, we, I ended up staying in Iraq, mm -hmm. in Baghdad for a couple of months, and then went to Fallujah for a couple of months before deploying home. And our Although our whole deployment was actually less than a year, mm -hmm. we were, had set out initially for a six-month training rotation, mm -hmm. which turned into a year-long tour, half of which was in combat. Uh -huh. So that sort of delayed, and you know, we postponed going home three or four occasions, mm -hmm. and it really messed with people. And it's, it's the little mm -hmm. things, like your personal finances, you only set things up for six months, and right. now you're gone a year. And, um, so it was, it was stressful. You know. Okay. Well, heading back to Baghdad, uh, this is now uh, still spring of 2003, yes. around that time? Yeah. Now, you mentioned that you were deployed to Fallujah. Uh, tell us about that. We were in Baghdad for uh, two months, and things started to heat up in Fallujah, and they, our vehicles were so beleaguered at that point. I mean, the tracks had fallen off. Mm -hmm. They literally couldn't go anywhere. We had nothing to resupply or fix them. Uh, we had cannibalized vehicles to save other vehicles, and so our force had kind of dwindled to 80% of what it was on wheels and tracks. And they said, you need to go to Fallujah, and we were kind of, at this point, I had switched positions right at this time. Mm -hmm. I went from being a platoon leader to the executive officer of the company, so second in command. And so the maintenance of the fleet for the company was kind of under my command, which is uh -huh. why it was on my thought, um, <laughs> on my thoughts. So we went to Fallujah, literally we basically got them onto big trucks and said uh, we towed, basically towed our vehicles you know, for a day over to Fallujah, which is west of Baghdad. Mm -hmm. And um, I had been forewarned by my interpreter, who was a sophomore at Baghdad University. I, remember, I never forget, he was a poli-sci major and mm -hmm. nicest kid, and he kind of volunteered his time to help interpret for me. And he said, oh, you don't want to go to Fallujah? I said, why? He's like, it's a city of thieves and crooks. And, you know, not very nice people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess Baghdad was a little more civilized, I don't know. But that was sort of what we experienced when we got there. Oh boy. So, uh, you, how long were you in Fallujah? We were in Fallujah about two months, um, and we had some somewhat regular contact. The insurgency was just starting to heat up there. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the year after we left, it got really bad there. Uh, so we just saw the beginning of that. Okay. And what were your duties while you were in Fallujah? So we, we had to, we interacted a lot with the mayor compound downtown Fallujah, was mm -hmm. sort of the local government. Um, we, would, we were trying to get a sense of what was going on, 
why was this sort of insurgency starting to mm -hmm. form there? And I think that was one of the initial hotbeds for the whole country. Mm -hmm. And um, then we started to get attacked. So we had a base outside the city and they began to shoot mortars at us on a regular basis. Um, I remember when I would leave the base, uh, somebody would shoot a flare. One of the, somebody in Fallujah, some, one of the locals mm -hmm. would shoot a flare in the sky. And they would sort of track our movement through the city with these flares. It was a very eerie and un uncomfortable feeling mm. as someone was tracking. And then when we stopped, you would see a different color flare go up. And it's like, okay, now they've just marked us. And right. then sure enough, we would get attacked shortly afterwards. Uh -huh. So Fallujah was pretty much what the interpreter had said, right? Yes, it was. Yeah. Oh, dear. And the, and the insurgents, were they supporters of Hussein or? I will never, I, you know, I'm sure many books will be written about <laughs> the uh, dynamics of what happened mm -hmm. in Iraq. I, you know, there was Sunni on Shia violence, mm -hmm. so there was sort of ethnic rivalry, rivalries. Um, there were Wahhabists, sort of this extreme religious group that would uh, kill barbers for shaving men's beards, for example. Um, there were, and then I think Iran had some influence on what was going on as mm -hmm. well, and they were trying to stir the pot. Um, in Fallujah, in and of itself, I don't know what was happening and why. And I think that's part of, unfortunately, the disconnect that we had. We didn't really understand situationally what was going on and mm -hmm. what were the dynamics at play. You mentioned earlier about your vehicles being not what they were when they first, uh, when you first deployed. Uh, were there regular supply lines? At this point, it was all disjointed. Um, mm -hmm. We started to get resupplied on a limited basis. I mean, we were fortunate that when we crossed the border from Kuwait, we had mm -hmm. as much ammo and then some as we could carry. Um, but we, we started to get more regularly resupplied at this point. Care mm -hmm. packages started streaming in, for example. Right. So all the toiletries we had run out of, we started getting a lot of. Um, mm -hmm. So anything from that to fuel and ammunition and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and you still had like limited contact with the locals, aside from those who were firing shots at you? You know, it was a, it was a strange time. I, I think at, at the very early stages, we would interact quite a bit with the locals. Mm -hmm. We just didn't know who we were in. There was no method to the madness. Right. It was sort of happenstance. Um, what I found a lot as well, there, there were big cultural divides. So we were, I think maybe because of our Western belief system, I took a lot of what I was being told. I was an officer, and mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, kind of liaise with locals and mm -hmm. I would take it at face value. I would take what they're telling me at face value. Well, mm -hmm. I, I found out that that was inaccurate 90% mm -hmm. of the time. A lot of what they were telling me just wasn't true or had mm -hmm. been manipulated. And so it was a lot of sort of uh, chasing loose ends that weren't there. And, and by that, I mean, they would tell me there's a weapons cache down the street. Mm -hmm. And we were in the process of trying to clean up all these weapons caches. Right. And we would go down there and there would be nothing. Mm -hmm. or, they tell me there's looting going on, and it was really they were trying to rat out their neighbor and get their neighbor in trouble, or mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot of those sort of interactions. So it was a very chaotic time period. Wow. It's, okay, so you're now in Fallujah. What uh, what happened next? So finally, after repeated postponements of going home, we got notice that we were in fact going to go home, and. Um, it was a big relief, and we were going to be relieved by another division that was coming in. Mm -hmm. And I got sent on an advance party to go to Kuwait uh, as an XO executive officer to kind of prep things and get things ready probably about four or five days before the rest of the unit was going to be there. Mm -hmm. And there was things like you had to get containers ready, um, inspectors lined up for uh, you know, bringing things home and things like that. And um, so I got to go on this convoy uh, from... Fallujah down all the way, you know, through back through Baghdad all the way down to Kuwait. And I remember crossing the border into Kuwait and it r really felt like a physical weight lifted off my back. And uh, I, I don't know how to describe the uh, kind of the elation of being out of that combat zone and not being on edge anymore, but it was something pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. so. Again, looking back uh, on your experiences in Iraq, do you think the Western media uh, put, uh, reported this correctly or with any degree of accuracy? 
Actually, I, I have to give them a lot of credit on this one because we had uh, MSNBC was embedded with my battalion, so mm -hmm. it was actually David Bloom, and he had this thing called a Bloom Mobile. He'd converted a military vehicle into, uh, he had a camera that kind of hung off the side of it mm -hmm. with stabilization technology, and right. he was right there with us. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, he passed away um, mm -hmm. while he was there, but they were right there with us through a lot of it, through thick and thin. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I will say that that part of it was, was pretty accurate in the beginning, for sure, during the major combat operations, absolutely, uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about now when they're reporting from Afghanistan? I think it's mixed. Um, on my second deployment, I was a battle captain, and I dealt a lot with the media. Mm -hmm. And I think you had most of it I, I didn't agree with. Uh, but you did get those reporters, those organizations that mm -hmm. did the deeper dive and the thorough analysis, and, and there was definitely some very respectful reporting. Mm -hmm. So I started to save articles that I thought were telling the true tale and sending them to my family, uh -huh. you know, from online or whatever the link. And, um, but yeah, it was, it was probably one in ten that mm -hmm. I felt carried its weight. So. All right, and now you're back in Kuwait. Tell us what happened next. So I... The whole unit showed up and we got ready to go home and there was a sort of, you know, delays and processing and accountability of stuff. We had lost mm -hmm. vehicles, equipment, you know, mm -hmm. everything's called a sensitive item. So mm -hmm. literally every attachment to your rifle and everything has got a serial number, is inventoried. And we had lost millions and millions of dollars worth of equipment while we were there. So now, you know, here comes the reckoning and we're sort of writing things off. Oh, this vehicle was destroyed and burned mm -hmm. up. and. Once we got through all that, you know, weeks of delays, we finally were headed home and um, took a flight home. And, you know, we went to Fort Stewart, Georgia, and uh, I had become engaged to my girlfriend mm -hmm. from UVM before I had deployed. And she was, she had shown up, she'd taken a week off work and she shown up and we came at the very end of that week because of all those delays. So I got to catch her for 24 hours, but mm -hmm. she was waiting in a crowd of families uh -huh. on this big parade field when we got off buses and we sort of marched across this parade field in the middle of the night. It must have been, you know, midnight. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the homecoming. It was, we had to sing the army song before they would let us come go to our families. <laughs> you know, those awkward moments. Oh dear. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was pretty amazing. And so you had 24 hours worth of fiance, then what happened? Then I got back to trying to be, you know, a barracks soldier, basically living on a base and not being deployed anymore. But I had uh, I took over the mortar platoon for the battalion, so it's mm -hmm. a specialty platoon. And their platoon sergeant was one of the two killed yeah. in our in the battle for Baghdad. And mm -hmm. the younger soldiers had really looked up to him, and I think a lot of them started to have a hard time coping with life. I think we all did. Yeah. And so a lot of that first six, 12 months back was dealing with social issues for the soldiers. So it was anything from spouse abuse to DUIs to mm -hmm. drug issues to, I mean, it was just trying to, mm -hmm. how do you tell an 18 year old who's just played the role of God for a month or five months, whatever it was, and then try and tell them to obey the speed limit, stop at a red light, mm -hmm. you know, be nice to the neighbor, you know, it was. It just didn't work. It wasn't a winning formula, mm -hmm. and they had a. We all had a hard time adjusting. Okay. And what was your rank at this point? I was. I was actually first lieutenant. So I'd been promoted from second lieutenant to first lieutenant in Kuwait, mm -hmm. and then um, I was first lieutenant when I took the mortar platoon. I, I can't remember exactly when I was promoted to captain, but mm -hmm. ultimately as a mortar platoon leader, I was. So how long were you at Fort Stewart? We ended up being at Fort Stewart for 17 months before going back to the sandbox. <laughs> uh, we got noticed that we were going to be back in rotation for Iraq, you know, about six months after being home. Mm -hmm. They stopped, lost the unit, so nobody could leave the unit, nobody could change stations or get out of the military, mm -hmm. and uh, we were headed back. And so, of course, during that 17 months, we had to train. So we did uh, month-long rotations in California. Um, in the woods of Georgia, mm -hmm. Fort Polk, Louisiana. And you were still uh, mortar platoon at this point? I was still more, I was mortar platoon uh, right up until we deployed, yeah. Okay. 
So uh, this, uh, let's see, 17 months gets us into around 2004, 2005? That's right. So we went, our uh, next tour was Operation Iraqi Freedom 3, which was the, the 2005. 2005, okay. It's basically January to January. Huh. Spending January 2005 back in Iraq. Uh, where were in Iraq? So I went back to Baghdad. Mm -hmm. um, we had the unit before us had had a really difficult time with Mutada al Sadr in mm -hmm. Sadr city, which is a northeast portion of Baghdad. It's basically a, 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 the projects of Baghdad. It's a massive mm -hmm. ghetto, and there's two million people that live in a very close proximity. Mm -hmm. And it's the kind of place where sewage was on the streets. And um, they, Sadr's Mahdi militia, had had an uprising. Uh, he called, made a call to arms during 2004 mm -hmm. and said, we need to get the Americans out of here. And there was some major fighting in Sadr City. And uh, that was where we were headed for 2005. Um, so I went to this base called Ford Operating Base Hope with 3rd Battalion, 15th Infantry, still the same unit. Mm -hmm. And it was right on the tip of northeast Baghdad. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us what happened next. So we, uh, we had to train. Now they had the Iraqi army. Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, you got to train the Iraqi army to take care of Iraq and to deal with the insurgency. So we started to train these soldiers that literally lived on the base. There was like a, a wall that divided the Iraqi army from the American army. Mm -hmm. um, but that had its complications as well. And I, I'll never forget, but I met with my Iraqi army officer counterparts, mm -hmm. so the leadership of this unit, some of whom had been um, you know, in the Republican Guard mm -hmm. and still were wearing their old uniforms. So I was looking at these guys wearing the uniforms that I was fighting against two uh -huh. years prior, or a year and a half prior, and it was a very sort of surreal experience. And I was literally looking at the people that I had just fought, and they were actually the better of the group. Um, what we started to find is that at that point, the organization wasn't very professional, and it was um, it was a combination of corruption and uh, insurgents who had made their ways into the ranks. Mm -hmm. um, and they were also very well connected with the community. And what I started to find is the ones that were good would hide their faces when we went in public because they didn't want the locals and the insurgents to know who they were mm -hmm. because there were consequences for their families and for them. Right. And um, what we would find is they would not show up to work one day. And we said, where are all the Iraqi army? And that would be the day they would fire mortars at our base. And it was those kinds of situations that would come up. Crazy times. <laughs> yeah. And how long were you uh, deployed at that part? So I was mortar platoon leader for mm -hmm. um, the first four months of 2005. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the brigade headquarters and uh, changed, changed over leadership of the mortar platoon, where I'd been platoon leader for almost two years. Mm -hmm. So it was a very long sort of time to be platoon leader, mm -hmm. and became the, um, one of the operations officers in the TOC, or the Tactical Operations Center for the Brigade, on a different base. Okay. And where was uh, Brigade? So the Brigade headquarters was sort of in the middle of the city. It was FOB Loyalty, Forward Operating Bo Base Loyalty. Mm -hmm. um, it was like on a major intersection. It was south of Sadr City. Mm -hmm. and. Um, that's where I spent the next eight months. I did a 12-hour shift from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., seven days a week. It was I split a shift, a 24-hour shift, with another mm -hmm. battle captain. And my job was to report on everything that happened in East Baghdad to our division headquarters mm -hmm. at Baghdad Airport. Must have been kept busy. It was, those were interesting times. There, was, uh -huh. um, there were days where we'd have a lot of car bombs and things like that. So I. Everything that was uh, noteworthy was called a SIG act or a significant action, and uh, you would sort of code things. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I would type up these reports in real time and post them on an intranet or secure sort mm -hmm. of web and uh, on a map so the division headquarters could see what was going on in East Baghdad mm -hmm. every day. As time went on, did Baghdad get more secure? Did the Iraqi army become more professional? Or 
was it just kind of throw your hands in the air and saying this is hopeless? <laughs> it, it was a little of both. Um, mm -hmm. There were elite units within the Iraqi army that started mm -hmm. to be formed and those turned out to be fairly good. Mm -hmm. I think they worked more with the American Special Forces. Right. Um, but it was, it was a frustrating year and this mm -hmm. was before the surge in 2007 that ended up calming things down. Mm -hmm. um, there were a fair amount of casualties that year. Mm -hmm. um, were there any casualties in your own unit or brigade? or? So three, my battalion had one killed uh, before I went to brigade headquarters. Uh -huh. And then when I was in brigade headquarters, the brigade's three, 4,000 soldiers. Mm -hmm. So of those, yeah, there was a fair number that were killed over the time we were there over the year. Mm -hmm. um, some battalions were harder hit than others, but a lot of it was IEDs. Um, and IEDs were? Improvised explosive devices. Mm -hmm. And in particular, we had two really nasty variations in East Baghdad. Mm -hmm. There were these uh, EFPs, explosive form projectiles. It was like a copper or steel mm -hmm. molten ball that would hit our vehicles. And then we had these big ones that were buried in the ground and could literally send a tank spinning into the air. Uh -huh. So pretty fatal bombs. What were your feelings during your time uh, in that part of Baghdad at that time, at that period? It was, we, we kind of hold up. Um, I think at, during that, it was one of those phases where, you know, at the very beginning of the conflict, we'd been more enmeshed with the local population, mm -hmm. chaotic as it was. Then we, you know, it was like cowboys and Indians. We sort of circled the wagons, put up these giant concrete barriers around every base, and we're behind barbed wire and concrete for mm -hmm. a year, and we very limited interaction with the locals. And any, any interaction was very controlled. Because at that point, we realized you couldn't trust anyone. Anybody could be a bad guy, even the ones you were working with. Um, the Iraqi police were worse than the Iraqi army at the time. Uh -huh. If you told them where you were going to be the next day, you could pretty much guarantee that there was going to be something waiting for you. Um, so it was a lot of mistrust. It was, it was a bad environment. Mm -hmm. And anytime you drove down a road, it was like playing Russian roulette. Uh -huh. You didn't know if today was going to be the day that a bomb was waiting for you and if you were going to be able to identify it. And they started to get very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And even the roads that a lot of repeat occurrences of IEDs, we could not, in, well, sometimes we could, but mm -hmm. more often than not, we could not identify mm -hmm. who was doing it, how they were doing it, until it was too late. Given all that you've been through, do, personally, do you feel that um, the American government was justified in coming to Baghdad and staying there for that long a period? Oh boy, I don't know. I've, uh, I've gone through many phases of that. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I don't think the phases are over. Okay. I, I, uh, <laughs> so that's answering without answering. Answering without answering. I, I mean, right now, it's going to take generations to change. Mm -hmm. And I, I, so I've, I've always maintained that. Um, it'll take generations to change the culture, the mentality, and to have a country that's functioning differently. Mm -hmm. uh, today, I think there's still a lot of issues, and if it, I had to make the call today, I'd say it wasn't worth it. Okay. How about your own attitude toward the Army, to your Army anyway? Uh, I had mixed feelings there as well. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things, I, uh, it was a very professional force. I, I think that f we got stretched very thin. Mm -hmm. A lot of soldiers did a lot of repeated deployments. Things like stop loss and mobilization of the National Guard and reserves, repeated, de repeated tours. Uh, that's a stress that I think was unfair to ask. Mm -hmm. um, and they've done some things to make good on that. Um, but at the, in the heat of the moment, I think a lot of people's lives were really significantly impacted for the worse, mm -hmm. um, or if not ruined, right. because of those stresses. So. Okay, so when did your second deployment end? So uh, we went back, I think it was either December 2005 or January 2006. You know, there's mm -hmm. like a three week transition in Kuwait mm -hmm. again, and um, we went back home and had another homecoming. Mm -hmm. um, 
another celebration. Okay, were you still engaged or have you married by this? I'd married between deployments. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd, it wasn't a shotgun wedding, but it was planned and executed in about two months, mm -hmm. which is <laughs> a year less than I think the average. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, no, it was, we got married to ple between tours and I came home and uh -huh. I got off active duty pretty much right away. Now, are you still um, in reserves? No, my for total eight-year commitment's over. Okay. So I resigned my commission. And when did that take place? Resigning my commission? Yes. That would have been, uh, actually I was able to do that in 2008, I want to say. Okay. And what have you done since then? I've been working for Corporate America. So I, work for, I worked for United Technologies. Mm -hmm. for f almost five years, and now I work for Philips. Have you joined any, um, excuse me, like the American Legion, VFW? I had joined uh, an American Legion post in Newton um, mm -hmm. for, I think it was maybe two years. And I went to one or two events. Uh, I think ultimately I had a difficult time connecting. There's a bit of a generation gap with veterans. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that you were being treated for PTSD at the VA hospital. Uh, did you um, take advantage of other benefits? For example, did you get the welcome home bonus? I did get a bonus for Massachusetts, mm -hmm. yes. Yes. For being a Massachusetts resident, mm -hmm. that's right. I did take advantage of that, and then uh, the VA as well, yeah. Okay. Uh, do you stay in touch with any members of your old unit? I do. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a, a unique bond with the ones that, the group of us that were in OIF 1 and 3, right. went through those repeated tours, and, um, but then there are guys that stayed in and went back a third and a fourth time, mm -hmm. some more, so I try and stay in touch, yeah. Okay. Is there um, anything else that you'd like to say for those who are going to be watching this in the future? Uh, I don't know. No, I don't think so. I, it's, mm -hmm. I've shared some of the gory details with some people and some families. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's one of those life-altering experiences that takes time to kind of heal and mm -hmm. to move on. But I'm definitely happy with where I am now. And mm -hmm. um, I guess I would encourage any veteran to, I think just about anybody that's been, especially repeated deployments, to seek. DSD therapy, even if they think they don't need it. So, mm -hmm. what do you think of the legislature, um, the, the recent moves by the legislature to improve veterans' benefits? I think it's been great. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of I took. I got to take advantage of actually. I met, forgot to mention this: the post 9/11 GI Bill, ah. which was very nice, and it was a mm -hmm. change to benefits that didn't exist previously. Mm -hmm. So, tell was, us a little bit about that. So previously, because I was a scholarship recipient uh -huh. uh, with ROTC, I was not eligible for the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. And the post-9-11 GI Bill granted eligibility based on time served, time served on active duty, past your commitment, and there's all sorts of variables. But it was a very fair um, and relevant to today approach mm -hmm. to providing education benefits. Mm -hmm. And I, I forget who championed the cause, but I think they were able to push it through fairly quickly. So I actually uh, went back and pursued my master's um, with part of that to help me out. Okay, and what did you uh, major in for your master's? I went to uh, Babson College to get an MBA. Okay. So. Anything else, Joe? No, thank you. Okay, well, Joe Shanahan, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us for the Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you. Thank you.